Yeah. Well, where's any of the cats when you need them? Well, right? till, till like she can't be relied on. No, that's true. That's true. Uh, fine. Let's do it. Good afternoon, everyone, <coughs> and welcome to the fourteenth of these classical concerts from quarantine just remarking with Robert as we were setting up to go live how unbelievably relaxed this whole process feels now compared to uh, what was quite a, a fraught and uh, heart fluttery vibe when we started all this a long time ago and as many of you know this today marks the end of the series in its current format we've decided that we would love to continue to do these lockdown or no lockdown, quarantine or no quarantine, um, but probably that Friday afternoon doesn't suit us or probably lots of you, especially in the summer, maybe as well as another time. Um, so we're going to move to Friday evenings, starting in a couple of weeks, Friday the 3rd of July, 7pm. Uh, uh, and we're also going to seriously upgrade your experience and um, we've already spent the last week 10 days um, collecting large amounts of gear now we just have to work out how to operate it all um, but it's very exciting and I think I'm sure you'll be very um, pleased with what we come up with uh, on that Friday um, so yes I bring you the last Sunday episode and uh, as ever, I guess, it goes without saying, you guys have been requesting some beautiful pieces, three of which I've got for you today. Um, we're going to start with some Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky was not entirely invested, I think it's fair to say, in the composition of his work, The Seasons. Um, the request came to him from a publisher, Nikolai Bernard, uh, and the publisher had a, a journal and he wanted to release one work for every month of the year in his journal on the first day of each month. And uh, so he paid Tchaikovsky quite handsomely, it seems. And I think, without wishing to be too cynical, it was the size of the fee rather than the true belief in the artistic endeavour that, uh, that sold Tchaikovsky on the idea. Um, this one, well, they were all kind of based on little ep epigraphs, um, little tiny snatches of poems. Um, this, in this case, uh, by a man whose name I absolutely can't pronounce. Um, Alexei, and then something beginning with P, uh, a, a Russian poet. Uh, and this has the subtitle Barcarolle, and it's uh, quite a melancholic take. Um, it's just a few lines describing the return to the shore, the waves lapping and the, the stars looking down with surprising dismay. Um, whew, I was going to say something else. Um, I think what's really interesting in this work at the beginning is how he flips between the major and the minor. Um, he uses pretty much the same tune. But when it's heard in the major, it sounds so unbelievably different to the minor. So the tune is basically just an upward scale. And that has a quite plaintive, melancholic feel. And then he writes almost that exact same tune, but in it he modulates, changes key, to the connected major. takes on a, a more sunny, hopeful predisposition. Rather a simple device, but quite ingenious. Um, music's in ternary form, like so many of the works I've been playing for you, uh, and the two outer sections are dominated by this scalic figure and with some lovely interplay between the hands. So once we've heard it the first time, the left hand starts to, to join in with some counter melody. Um, where's this? Rather effective duet. And then the middle section is more positive. It moves into the major. We get a feeling of buoyancy. Probably the only time in the piece that the spirit of the Barcarolle is really manifested. 
Uh, and again, it's quite a simple device that he uses to help us with this, but it's very, very effective. So the right hand is spinning a very simple melody. And the left hand is interjecting with these offbeat accompaniments. gives us this feeling of constant levity, of constantly being buoyed, of bouncing along rather like one would be on, on the waters. Um, we know Tchaikovsky to be quite a conflicted, troubled man, um, both on a professional level. He, his studies and his general outlook meant that he separated himself a little bit from the big five, these, these five pillar Russia composers that had come just before him, who's whose music had been deliberately uh, nationalistic and, uh, and shunned kind of Western classical traditions. But because of Chopin's more traditional studies at the newly started St. Petersburg Conservatoire, he um, imbued his music with more of this Western tradition. Uh, but this kind of left him a little bit betwixt and between in his lifetime. Lots of Western audiences didn't consider him to be Western enough and lots of Russian audiences didn't consider him to be too Western. And it's really, uh, I think it's only now, well, not only now, but only maybe after his death that he came to be adored by classical, by, by all music lovers, and um, probably more than his contemporaries. So he has this amazing, the music is undefinably Russian. It has a heaviness and it has an intensity that sets it aside, that sets it very clearly in that box. Um, but his sense of proportion and his great melodies um, are what we really, I think, love him for, and few people could write a melody as wonderful as Tchaikovsky. Um, this is for Laura and David, completing your request from last week, which started with the Mozart. I know what I was going to say. Of course, this is the June uh, month from the seasons in his set, and of course we are on uh, summer solstice weekend, which is why I thought it would be appropriate to drop it in here for you now. I hope you enjoy.
Yeah, I always think how in all these works, all these great works, so little of the writing is remotely accidental. Composers always thinking so deeply about everything they're doing. So after we had the syncopated middle section, what does he do at the very end in order to unify the end of the piece with the music that came in the middle? The left hand takes on this syncopation again in that last bit I just played to you. Very cool, very cool. Right, um, on to some lists. This is maybe an opportunity to thank you for all your wonderful donations. Uh, as of this morning, I think we were, I don't know, not much away, to be honest, from our target, so I'm not even particularly stressed anymore about making it. I think that's, uh, that's pretty much assured. And to be honest, when I started these concerts, um, the target, setting a target of thousands was, I think, wishful rather than, uh, real. Um, and... Yeah, it's just been very overwhelming week by week to feel your support and feel your generosity in that way. It's been incredible. The NHS will get at least £5,000, depending on how much we can make in this, these last few days. Um, and I think this time has made us kind of aware of how much we should, if we don't, or do already value that incredible institution and the remarkable people who work therein. Um, I think it's probably quite fitting that at this time we are bringing the donations to the NHS to a close. Um, while lockdown, quarantine, COVID uh, put a responsibility on all of us to do our bit and pile in together, I know that a lot of you have, have expressed to me a sentiment that I share which is that you know, we live in a democracy, in a society where the NHS is funded through taxation, as it should be, so that it can remain free at the point of use for everyone in our society. And although in times of stress we must all do our bit, it is not our responsibility necessarily to also do other things to raise money for that institution. And if we feel like that institution isn't being supported, isn't being given the funds it needs by the people whose job it is to do that, then we can make our voices heard maybe louder in discontent and we can opt for different people to run the systems like that in the future. So for that reason, we're gonna to move to a different charity when we restart in a couple of weeks. I wanted to do something that was more obviously to help my colleagues and fellow musicians. There's a wonderful charity called Help Musicians UK. Uh, they've supported me in the past and I know because I've been in touch with them just the amazing things they're doing at the moment to help people like me and my friends and colleagues um, to stay afloat at a time when everyone's work has kind of collapsed. So there will still be the opportunity for you to show your support and I very much hope that you guys will continue to do that and in doing so you'll be more directly supporting the people performing for you here each week and also people all over the country, musicians all over the country through the charity. Um, this next work is almost somehow kind of defies proper description it's, it's just kind of gargantuan on so many levels and one almost doesn't know where to begin. Um, I discovered it kind of by mistake. My teacher Charles at, at Guildhall 10, 12 years ago recommended it to me, thought it would suit me and yeah, and, I, and it changed me hugely then when I played it. And, um, and it's been incredible returning to it these last 10 days or so. Um, Benediction de Dieu dans la solitude. So the benediction of God in solitude. Um, Liszt was at a very important point in his life when he wrote this work. This is 1847. 
Um, to give you a bit of context, List had tried quite hard to go into to take holy orders when he was a very young man uh, and had been thwarted once by his father and also by his abbe um, and therefore had turned his uh, had turned his attentions more to the career of composer and concert pianist at which he was revelatory uh, to a point that the world had seen few even comparable to him hitherto um, but his faith never remained far from his mind and in 1847 he turned his back on really his, uh, his career as a performer um, he would continue to teach uh, and he would give charity recitals this was also the time when he met his and started to spend much more time with excuse me animating pretzels a couple of days ago i've been harvesting them solidly um, this is also a time in his life when he met his second wife, uh, Carolyn uh, Wittgenstein. And uh, in this period when he wrote this work specifically, he was spending a lot of time uh, in her palatial uh, residence. In quite a lot of solitude. And I think he was understanding that having turned his back on life as a performer, he would have a lot more time of solitude and reflection. And this was as good a time as ever to really redirect his focus back to his faith. And indeed, in the final part of his life, he was to take orders at long last in the completion of what seemed like a, a very cyclical kind of destiny that had started when he was so young. I think it's really important in this work to understand that solitude has nothing to do with loneliness here. Um, I was only talking to a friend of mine the other day that said that you can be, we were talking about the phenomenon that you can be totally alone and, and feel total loneliness when you're surrounded by your friends. And similarly, you can be alone in nature for extended periods of time or alone anywhere and feel completely at peace and harmony. So the solitude here doesn't invoke those kinds of feelings. It's more to be understood in a more religious context. The idea that by taking solitude, you clear your life and your head for a more direct and intense relationship with God. Um, and this is something I think we can all relate to nowadays, even if we're not particularly religious. One only has to look at the explosion of activities like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, uh, to see how all humans, regardless of their creed, crave this kind of time of reflection and deepening their sense of self. Uh, so the piece is vast, but actually the structure is very, very simple, and it's our old classic ternary form again, just spread over a good 20 minutes or so. And what happens fundamentally is that in the outer two sections, sorry, I should probably say what benediction is. Benediction is a, a, someone's evocation, invocation of kind of divine protection. Um, so a kind of uh, communion with an almighty for comfort and, and asking for joy, protection, salvation. Um, so the outer two sections de deal more with that and they each start very, uh, quite intimately and build to enormous climaxes. And in those enormous climaxes, the way he, it's written, it's, it's quite extraordinary. There's not much of a melody and the accompaniment is almost more important than what's going on in the melody. And the effect is just of this roar of sound. I often feel as if my ears are just ringing and it's not from volume, it's just from the, I mean, it's loud, don't get me wrong, but it's from all the different sonorities that he set up that are clashing and jangling against each other. We just get this almighty feeling of being overwhelmed. And because the music is so broad, these climaxes take a long time to arrive so when they do, they're even more powerful. The central section is separated, separated from the main section um, with an extraordinary marking that I'd never seen before. Um, on the score, he writes... How clear is that? Yeah, maybe clear enough. On the score, he writes um, these, these dotted lines here, which I've never seen before in any other piece of music. In fact, I was only speaking that... To, about that with a student of mine, Edward, the other day. Um, 
as in as far as to really set the two outer sections aside from the middle section now uh, a, a, a fairly common um, religious practice was often to punctuate these times alone in communion with God with more um, with some more activities such as reading or studying the Gospels um, and not so kind of tran in not such a kind of transcendent and spiritual state of mind in a more kind of um, with, a more, with a greater feeling of learning and study and so what this central section seems to be to me and I certainly think it's quite clear in the music the, the heavenly halo type sounds are gone the music is much simpler and it seems to be much more much if you like the two outer sections are much more church churchy and the middle section is much more human um, lots of things go through my mind when i play this piece when the music comes back in the section just after the middle section he writes quasi preludio like a prelude and this is like a little tagged on section before the main material returns and it it's so broad and it's so vast and it moves so slowly it reminds me of the the kinds of noises you hear when you're in a cathedral in a vast cathedral and i'm not talking about organized noise i'm talking about the kind of casual echoes the deafening silence the unbelievable breadth and width of those institutions um just a word about the harmony and his use of musical language. Um, Liszt was a visionary. I think somewhere along the lines, the idea that a man could be deeply religious and want and have interest in taking holy orders and also uh, be twice married and also be a real flashy superstar who made people lose their minds when they saw him perform has led people to, to not think led people in many of their minds to trivialize list who he was what he stood for maybe to view him as a bit of a hypocrite as well i think thankfully we're we're wiser than we were as as an audience in terms of what kind of a guy he was now um but also i think we're also starting to see just how forward thinking his writing was so for him in 1847 to be writing sections like out of the playbook of the French Impressionist language but it's a good 40 years ahead of its time which in musical considerations is, is, is just ages. Um, one of the particular devices that he uses in this piece and I think I know why or I have an idea why is uh, pentatonic writing. Now pentatonic writing is best explained by thinking of uh, it just being made up of the five black notes on the piano. And I'm sure many of you have experimented with just trying out the five black notes on their own and making melodies from them. Um, uh, there are lots of pentatonic keys, but that's the easiest one to show you all. Um, chromatic writing and chromaticism in music is often thought of as associated with pain and struggle. And therefore I think it's quite right and appropriate that in this work, there is barely any chromaticism. And what's one of the easiest ways to avoid chromaticism? It's to operate within the pentatonic key. And so while we start at the beginning with quite simple harmonies, um, but we're in a key that contains a lot of black notes anyway, uh, as the music gets richer and we reach our climax, uh, he operates more and more and more in the pentatonic world. <laughs> kind of wafts and floats in this beautiful halo of sound. At the very end, the last page, there's a kind of uh, postlude, very worthy of Schumann, I think, um, which begins with rolling chords, is very improvisatory and free, uh, then becomes incredibly simple. Then we hear the intimate central section, the more human music come back, and finally we rest back home. And at peace. An extraordinary work. This is for Pierre. Pierre, thank you very much for your request. I knew I could count on you to request something off the beaten track. 
and uh, it's been wonderful for me to revisit this this piece and uh, thank you for all your support over the years even though you maybe weren't aware of it uh, you know when when we first met I was still very inexperienced as a teacher and the way you supported empowered and trusted me to help uh, teaching your son uh, really really meant a lot and really kind of gave me the confidence to feel like yeah okay I do have something to offer here maybe maybe I can help other people too um, it'd be lovely to see you guys again sometime but for now have a little bit of a benediction
What a piece. Yes. What I like about, well, many things that I think uh, why music is it, is the universality of it. Um, I'm not particularly religious, although I have been in my life. Um, and of course, very few people, well, not very few people, but by no means the whole of the of the world can relate to Catholic faith and Carmelite tradition. But everyone gets that. And it doesn't matter that it is about specifically God in that case. It deals with just understanding that we are not it. And that there is more to a more of a point maybe or even if you don't want to say more of a point, there are forces and things in existence in the universe that we must be beholden to and that we must respect. And if we can connect with them and live sustainably and harmonically with them, then our souls are immeasurably enriched because of it. So yeah, good stuff. Um, we're going to finish with a piece of Ravel. This was written when he was a student, and I don't think he probably thought very much of it at the time. Um, but it went on to become one of his best loved works. This is his Pavan pour une enfant de foot. De foot? I don't know how one pronounces it. Um, when I first came across this piece, I thought it must be have real elements of tragedy to it, to it for it. Real elements of tragedy about it. Pavan for a dead child. Um, possibly it was to do with personal loss or, or who knows. So actually it's more of a fantastical story behind this work. Um, a pavan was a type of slow professional, pr professional, processional dance that was very much in vogue in the European courts of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. And uh, this is Ravel imagining a dead princess, but only dead in the sense that she has never lived. So he's imagining a, 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 a fantastical princess and how, child princess, and how she might have danced the pavan. Um, having said all this, there is a very stately and solemn, if not always quite sombre, uh, element to this piece. We've talked a lot over the last few months about how composers uh, achieve what they want in their pieces. We've talked about how if you want a feeling of lilt and ebb and flow then writing in three time is very helpful. But as I've mentioned the Pavan is a stately processional dance. So Ravel writes four beats in a bar and the beats are very clearly defined with a left hand providing some support on all of them except the first beat. is also filling in the gaps between those so that we get an amazing kind of tick-tocking, rhythmic, poiseful feeling. Um, it's been a funny weekend. On, on Friday night, um, Gabby's family's dog died. And this was, uh, it's all happened rather quickly and unexpectedly. And... Uh, 
yeah so the last 36 hours have been pretty tough and it's been it's been obviously incredibly it's not just sad the loss in and of itself but then when you see your loved ones in so much pain that uh, obviously gives an added dimension to it and I always think animals have this incredible quality of being able to take on whatever we want them to take on um, because we can never know what's going on in their head and because they can never talk to us they become the vessels for our unspoken hopes, dreams, thoughts, fears, fantasies. They can become bridges between people who otherwise would struggle to connect. And of course, they're also marvelous companions. So even though the dog in question was a rather clumsy, ungainly, but very beautiful looking beagle, uh, he had a nobility about him because of the way in which he was loved and because of the relationship defining role that he held. Um, so I, I hope that the irony of playing this piece with so much that has so much nobility to it will not be too much inappropriate for a dog who used to make us laugh by being so so ungainly and foolish. Um, so Diesel, Daria, and uh, everyone uh, who loved that beautiful animal, this is for you.
brings these 14 weeks of Sunday, three o'clock, uh, well, joys for me, to an end. Big red letter day for your diaries is 7 p.m. on Friday, July the 3rd. And that will see us right back here in this room, but unlike you've seen us ever before. Um, and we're all very excited. Um, and I can only reiterate my thanks, gratitude, love for all of your solidarity, tuning in, commenting, requesting, and of course donating over the last, blimey, three and a half months. Um, the UK is emerging slowly but surely out of lockdown and I, of course we all hope that that goes as smoothly as possible and, uh, and we can get back to normal lives, normal relationships, normal passions, normal freedoms as soon as possible. Um, the only thing you can do other than donate, if you haven't done so already, is buy my DVD. The link's underneath the, the video. That would be awesome. And I'll see you, hopefully, in just under two weeks. Have a lovely rest of your Sunday.